Hey folks, in this video we are going to talk about the features already here, AI generative tools and teaching. This is a webinar I did for NERCOMP uh, in late February 2023. Uh, I hope by the time you're watching this that it's still relevant, but given the rate at which things are changing around AI generative tools like ChatGPT, uh, it, pieces of this may very well be already relevant. So let's get to it. First off, uh, I would like to start with an equity acknowledgement. This presentation was prepared using ChatGPT, an AI chatbot. I acknowledge that ChatGPT and many AI generative tools do not respect the individual rights of authors and artists and ignore concerns over copyright and intellectual property in the training of the system. Additionally, I acknowledge that the system was trained in part through the ex exploitation of precarious workers in the global south. In this work, I specifically used ChatGPT to test out some ideas about its usage, better understand the tool, and may also demonstrate some of the ways it generates answers. So what we're going to cover in this, uh, we're, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, some of it will be familiar, some of it may be new. I strongly encourage folks to, you know, whatever they see, feel free to uh, pursue. Hey, feel free to use the comments to violently disagree with me. Um, particularly, I'm a fan of emojis that really strike, you know, one's ire. So first, I'm going to uh, place AI in the context of higher education and educational technology. Then we're going to spend some time talking about the terrain, the different conversations that are evolving in higher education in the last three months since ChatGPT first showed up on the scene. I'll move into explaining the situation at my institution, College Unbound, and what we have done and why. And then we'll, you know, I'll just kind of throw out a little bit of prophecy and what I think will happen next. And in terms of questions, I really hope folks will throw these into the comments below or reach out to me and we can have some rich conversation on here or on social media. Those two links uh, right there are, uh, they're hand, they it includes a handout of the resources um, that I continually am updating, and then the slide deck itself, which is uh, all, both of which are covered under Creative Commons licenses in case you want to uh, build upon or add and uh, make use of. All right, so things I can promise about what this webinar will deliver. Uh, there'll be lots of links and additional materials. You've already seen that in the resources. Uh, a minimum amount of staring at the screen while I enter prompts into ChatGPT. Uh, I've watched a lot of videos, I've been to a lot of things, and I see this happening a lot. It's not something I will probably be doing here uh, because I think there's other things I want to talk about around ChatGPT that I think are important for educators. A clear sense of where you fit in within the conversations about AI and education. I think this is something that hasn't been talked about as much, which is why I did the webinar and I'm doing this video. Uh, you'll probably end up with more questions and fewer answers than you would hope for, um, and that's unfortunately just the nature of where we are within all of this. And then finally, you'll at least see one photo of each of my pets throughout this presentation. So let's get started. So ChatGPT arrived in late November and very quickly got a lot of attention and interest. It became a very curious tool that got typical fanfare uh, of everything from this will change everything to meh to well, this is a nothing burger. Uh, but by the end of January 2023, two months after its launch, it had over 100 million monthly users. As a point of reference, TikTok took nine months to get to 100 million users. Instagram took 2.5 years, and Facebook 4.5 years to get to 100 million users. Schools are wrapping up in, December, in the December uh, fall semester, and they weren't really paying much attention. And so a few for folks that were paying attention to or, or thinking about this um, started to kind of talk and think about what this means. But then January hit, and higher ed was just like, Ah, right? What is this? Um, and to be clear, not all of higher ed was like this, but there was definitely uh, been an adverse reaction to the arrival of ChatGPT, and there's good reasons for that, as we'll go into shortly. But for many, it, it finally showed up on their radar just as the semester was starting, and there was a lot of confusion, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of discussions going on across all sorts of uh, places within institutions, lots of different platforms, from, from Twitter to LinkedIn to Facebook to uh, uh, Mastodon to uh, Google Groups. There's, there's just a lot of rich conversations going on. 
So for some folks, this conversation is entirely new. In others, it's been something that they have been aware of directly or indirectly for a while. Uh, we've kept hearing about AI, artificial intelligence, particularly in pop culture. And many of us grew up with the ever persistent story that AI was going to kill us all. Uh, whether it was the Terminator or Cylons or Daleks or HAL 9000 or Ultron, or of course the most insidious of them all, Clippy. And this is where folks in the know have really been trying to center the conversation in terms of language uh, that we use and, and help us understand what the tools really are that we're looking at and trying to kind of um, redirect us away from those more apocalyptic uh, versions of AI, at least for now. Right? So ChatGBT is the catalyst for a whole slew of new tools that have come our, uh, that are come out or will be coming out in the near future. And it's not just about text, right? ChatGPT is important because it's gotten on educators' radars because it replaces text. And so many, many of us rely on uh, students writing text of one sort or another um, as their sole means of evaluation. Therefore, like throughout this, the term I keep going back to is AI generative tools uh, because it is bigger than the conversation of just ChatGPT. And that's where I try to do uh, focus my language on is to really understand that idea of AI generative besides just ChatGPT. It's also worth pointing out um, the language of generative versus creative. Generative, one of the things that we see within this is all ChatGPT, I shouldn't say all, but the gist of what ChatGPT is doing is building upon and generating math sequences based upon the input, that is the questions or the things that you put into it, and it's a data set, right? So it's generating, it's generating numbers. It's, it in itself is not generating things that it knows. It is not conscious, it is not uh, a lot of you know the the hype stuff out there situates like oh ChatGPT is you know falling in love or it has a dark side or all. the ChatGPT isn't sentient. It is mathing the hell out of things. Um, and what I mean by that is it is taking the data that you put into it when you put in a prompt and breaking that up into small little chunks and looking at the relation the mathematical relationships across those chunks in relation to the vast data set it has. And the vast data set it has is much of the internet up through 2021. So there's lots of stuff it doesn't have, anything that's happened after 2021. And there's really, it's just trying to connect the relationships of the text. It is not consciously trying to, you know, uh, tell you things. It's just this, this mathematical equation of back and forth of what you put into it and what it delivers. All right. So, um, Maybe this scenario can uh, better visualize why this is a bigger conversation than just ChatGPT. And of course, this scenario falls somewhere along the continuum from it's super amazing and we live in the future to it's super scary and oh shit, we live in the future. Um, so right now, it's possible to have ChatGPT write a speech. Plug that speech into a tool like slides.ai, which is an AI slides generator. And then use a voice, a AI voice cloner to read the speech. Um, you could have that recorded, uh, that recording, you could have that speech recorded and submit it uh, for online assignments, or you could use it to build out your YouTube channel. I promise you what you're listening to now is an actual human being and was not generated by ChatGPT or slides.ai or any of that. Um, but these are the range of tool, uh, tools that we're talking about, text generators like ChatGPT, image generators like Dolly, and voice generators like Volley, right? These are tools that are out there that could be mixed and matched or a new one that puts all of them together. You know, say, you know, I, I can imagine these can be linked together at some point in the future where it's just like, hey, you know, uh, give me a presentation using my voice uh, around this particular topic. So it feels very much like the vast majority of mental work that gets turned into tangible deliverables for evaluation in higher education is very quickly becoming possible to be generated by AI. And of course, that's the concern. That's the challenge that we're trying to figure out. Another way of understanding ChatGPT is that it's very much like the first, uh, like the arrival of the first generation iPod, which arrived in October 2001. 
Many folks remember this as the first MP3 player on the market, and this was the game changer. This was what made all of us start to go to MP3 music instead of CDs or cassettes or what have you. Uh, but there were actually several other MP3 players before, including the Rio uh, PMP 300, uh, which came out actually in September 1998, almost three, about three years before the iPod. And I mention this only because I actually remember owning a Rio, and I remember being really excited about it, and then I iPod came along and then finally everybody else knew like, oh my gosh, this is this is really cool. Um, and so I, I mentioned this to help folks understand that ChatGPT is not the first AI tool out there, um, but it is part of this ongoing conversation and dialogue already in place as other tools and practices have arrived. So for instance, Donald Clark literally already wrote the book on artificial intelligence for learning back in 2020. So there's a larger conversation around AI. ChatGPT is the catalyst, but there's a lot more going on around this. All right. I also want to situate ChatGPT and AI generative tools in this larger context of higher education, right? Um, uh, higher education and technology. And it, this is what often goes unacknowledged within the discussion about ChatGPT right now or AI generative tools. That is, there's all these things that have become part and parcel of the higher educational, land, higher educational landscape, many of which we have to think about, prepare for, utilize, and integrate into our classes. And while the claims are that all of this technology saves us time, I have trouble believing anyone feels like, like that when it comes to teaching they are spending less time than 30 years ago. I've only been teaching for 17 years and it doesn't, doesn't seem like I'm spending any less time uh, on preparing and teaching my courses. And I'm definitely spending more time. And sometimes I'm okay with that, but the, preponder uh, the preponderance of so many different tools, many of which are required, many of which are deeply entrenched in our teaching and learning these days, um, it's a lot. And so ChatGPT is one more along those lines that we just, we have to acknowledge and think about. So let's, uh, let's take a quick rundown of all the revolution, and I put that in air quotes, revolutionary technology and tech practices that have become essential to a modern classroom. Um, in how they were, did, or may soon disrupt higher education. So the first is, of course, the internet, the grandparent of them all. Um, with that came the bane and workhorse of every institution, the LMS or learning management system. Uh, we then started to see and realize, oh, online videos are possible, right? That was just about the time we were getting ridiculously ecstatic about Web 2.0. Uh, how many folks started blogs? Are they still doing their blogs? Uh, my blog began, my, my blog recently became a teenager and it is such a pain in the butt. Um, it wants its own smartphone, it's angry, and, it, and I won't let it go on TikTok, so it hates me. Um, the struggle is real. I actually read recently uh, a whole lot of excitement, uh, a whole lot of excitement, uh, that blogs were making a comeback. Of course, they're all going to be filled with ChatGPT content. Web 2.0 also gave us the modern version of Wikipedia, uh, which also was the scariest thing for many in higher education since chalkboards were slowly being replaced with whiteboards. Um, you know, it felt like the pure anarchy. Uh, this was, this was going to be nuts. You know, Wikipedia is going to just throw us all for a loop. There's, there's lots of parallels between Wikipedia and ChatGPT. Uh, and then came mobile devices. First it was the smartphone and then gasp. The tablet. Schools scrambled to figure out if they should ban them or give them to every student or just tell everyone to bring them if you've got them. On the coattails of mobile devices, we also saw the rise of the Godzilla of higher education, the MOOC. It was, you know, it, it, it was going to change everything, everything, until it didn't. But a lot of people got rich, a lot of, a lot of learning happened, and even a larger amount of people started one MOOC or more and never looked back at the MOOCs. Uh, I was certainly guilty of joining a lot of MOOCs that I never finished. All right. After that, we had hybrid courses, uh, which were also taking off during this time. And while we had more flavors of hybrid than ketchup, it largely settled on the idea that we would meet face to face less, uh, less often and do more learning in the LMS or elsewhere. And that seemed to be the way things were going. But then we had a pandemic and everyone had to learn how to, how to teach via Zoom, right? We had to learn how to do this via Zoom in the middle of the semester while everything was shutting down and toilet paper temporarily became a currency. 
The pandemic was still raging and killing people, but administrators insisted that being back in the classroom, at least for the instructors, was essential. So then we started this thing called hybrid flexible, uh, hybrid flexible teaching, where you designed, you were designing for in-person students and virtual students and possibly creating a parallel asynchronous course, all of course for the same pay. And just when we thought we had given up caring about ma caring about masks or quarantining, and we thought we might have a normal semester or two, ChatGPT came along. And if you're not exhausted from thinking about all that and how you and your colleagues survived and adapted through all that, then I'm impressed. I am really impressed, and would also know, uh, would also love you to take it from here because it's just so much for so many of us. All right, so. Here we are. Over the past few months, uh, the conversations have been swirling and happening in departments and division meetings, across meals and classrooms, and very much across the internet in blogs and podcasts, Twitter, Mastodon, Facebook, TikTok, Reddit, and beyond. So what I hope to do in this section is to give you the contours of these conversations. So a few caveats to start. The first, there are likely others in more emerging, but these are the strongest that I'm currently seeing. Many are not mutually exclusive. As you think about your own approach, consider uh, what makes sense and draw from whichever one feels the right, you know, the right type of conversation that you want to be a part of. I would not say that these are necessarily right or wrong conversations to be a part of or to take up, though I think it's certainly important to be grounded in the firm pedagogical understanding of learning science before taking too strong of a stance in any of them. And lastly, I'm going to have my biases and I'm going to try not to show them, but I really can't make any promises. All right, so first up we have ban and punish. Uh, this is where we take that firm and strongly language stance about using ChatGPT or other AI generative tools. Uh, simply put, you use it, you're in trouble. Right? And the benefits of this is it's simple, or as I put here, simply, because I didn't clearly edit this well enough. It's clear and it allows the instructor to spend more time on other things related to the class. Some of the drawbacks, abstinence doesn't work. It didn't work in prohibition. It didn't work in the war on drugs. It didn't work in sex education. Like it just is not a great policy. Um, so you're left with that. And that means also students lose the opportunity to understand the tool in the course context. How is this tool going to impact the discipline that you are teaching? And then also it does set up the structure for a lot of mouse trapping, a lot of the instructor checking and trying to catch or see if students used it or not. And that's just, that's a lot of energy. Um, that's a lot of things that just feel challenging to navigate on top of everything else. All right, then we have the simply simplify and avoid it. In this case, you just connect it directly to academic honesty, uh, and that is you must cite it when it is in use, uh, and then you there's less need to discuss it any further. Like this is you do this the same way you would cite, you know, you would do quotes or you would do uh, paraphrasing or anything like that. Benefits here, it connects with something students are already more, you know, are, are more familiar with. It's mostly clear. I do think it's not as clear as we like to think it is, but it's it's mostly clear. Um, and again, you spend more time on other things within the course. S drawbacks uh, may not be as clear as needed, right? I don't think uh, it's always clear. That is our, our justifications for when to cite and how to cite. Like, it's convoluted. Students know this, and that adds to some of the reasons why they don't. So this is this is just piling more on that. Uh, you lose the opportunity to understand the tool in the course context, and again, there's going to be some more time spent on mouse trapping. Then they're just thinking about it as a classroom tool. Uh, in this case, it's a learning tool in creation or writing process to generate ideas or examples to work with. Or you consider how it will be used in their respective, and that should say industries, but of course I didn't, you know, I didn't uh, edit this or I didn't put this into ChatGPT to clean up uh, all of my typos, but that should say in their respective industries and careers and how to use it in those contexts. And I think that's an important piece here. Many of our students are going to have to work with this in their industries. And so to not have it as some piece of the course feels wrong. Again, that's my bias. All right, and then also a tool for critical exp exploration. So the benefits, um, you know, it's an opportunity to explore the benefits and limitations of these tools. It gives contextual familiarity around the tool and the particular course, 
and it creates opportunities to understand and see new uses. I mean, one of the things I'm really enjoying is continually learning the new ways people are using this and leveraging this and helping them in, in particular ways or in particular fields. The drawbacks, um, it may, like, Faculty may feel they need to mandate usage of tools we don't fully understand. That feels a little uncomfortable. So making students create accounts um, and make them use it, even though we don't understand the long-term repercussions of that. Along those lines, it is also, you know, it may violate or push privacy boundaries for students. You know, what does it mean to make students get an account? Or is it something where, you know, you set up a dummy account for the course and everybody can use that account? Um, and then you also are giving up time on other course elements. So there, there are trade-offs here, right? An AI's instructor tool, right? So this is where the instructor actually uses it and they use it to create the curriculum. They use it to create examples that students can analyze and, you know, and, and work with or just examples for assignments that they, they have students doing because, you know, we're all, students are often needing examples. And so something that could actually create those examples pretty quickly would be really helpful. Uh, it's, you could use it in helping and developing assessments. I've seen, you know, lots of great people doing this kind of stuff. And then you could also use it to provide targeted feedback, either in creating things like quizzes with targeted feedback for each of the answers, or actually, you know, using, using it to help come up with the feedback for a student or just to better word the feedback you're giving a student. Some of the benefits could save time. Uh, it creates content that might not have been within reach of the instructor, right? We may be, uh, instructors may be uh, uh, subject matter experts, and also there may be some things that are harder for them to teach than others. And so being able to use a tool like this to better think about how that information is presented could be really helpful for student and faculty. Uh, it can give insights that can help in teaching. You know, this is one of the areas where, you know, you can ask it to really customize the, the wording, the ideas to a particular level or to a particular audience. Um, and it can actually give more effective, insightful feedback. Um, it may be able to catch up on, th catch things that you may have missed. The drawbacks. Um, I think in some ways this sets us up to reinforce the de-skilling of faculty. Uh, in that it becomes more and more a tool that is seen as valuable in these ways and therefore the role of the instructor becomes less. It lacks transparent, it lacks transparency and equity if the students can't use it. This is one that I'm really uh, a big about. I, I wrote an article about uh, LMS and transparency with an LMS. I called it the new LMS rule and I would apply it here that, you know, the instructor needs to be as transparent about the use of this tool as they expect the students to be. So if, if you are saying you need to cite it, quote it, identify it, only use it in these limited ways, then you need to follow that policy too. Like there's a, there's a balance there that's important. And then of course the, the other drawback is, you know, questions of privacy, student labor, and copyright. If, you know, if you are taking students work in putting it in to chat GPT to provide feedback. There's questions about whether you legally should be able to do that. There's questions about privacy of the students work. There's questions about the students labor, what they have written being put into chat GPT and now part of that data set. So these are things you want to think about if, if you're going to use it around that, that part, uh, that targeted feedback practice. And then there's the critical, critical takes. Right, and this, it's examining the context of AI tools, what they do, and how that intersects with the course discipline in disruptive and problematic ways. Uh, that might also include identifying the underlying structures of inequity that empower AI generative tools, such as algorithmic, algorithmic bias, digital red learning, redlining, digital colonialism, de-skilling, and gig economical practices, right? So one of the things we know about ChatGPT is that by and large, in order for it to be made safe to uh, English-speaking audiences, that Ch the OpenAI uh, basically used a third-party vendor to hire Kenyans for $2 an hour to content moderation, uh, to content moderation of ChatGPT. And content moderation is just a nice way of saying, um, basically traumatized, being exposed to the worst of the internet and inducing trauma in the users uh, worldwide. Anybody that's doing content moderation is often being subject or, or is experiencing a variety of trauma because you are weeding out the worst of the internet. So here is this, this 
company that's going to be making billions and billions of dollars and it paid people in Kenya two dollars an hour to be traumatized. Um, so if you're taking a critical take, if you're exploring that, then you're raising questions like that about what does it mean to use these tools and how should we understand um, what is powering the availability of this. And then also identify, determine, and exploit flaws in the tool to provide a better understanding of its limitations. Where does it fail miserably? Benefits of this, clarifying the limitations of techno-utopian discourses. Uh, Sam Altman, the creator of ChatGPT, definitely has this view of like, man, technology is going to solve everything. And we've heard this for thousands of years, and we're still not there. Uh, it re reiterates the importance of liberal arts approaches to study, and it raises concerns about populations vulnerable to technological exploitation. The drawbacks, it could detract from the course's focus, um, and depending on where you sit and how you see that, that might be a, a concern. Uh, it creates an adverse view that limits learning and the use of the tool when necessary. That is, without really great answers, but just lots of questions. Um, as we say in the next one, right, generates questions, but not necessarily answers. These things can create an aversion to it, even if uh, that might create some missed opportunities or make it challenging for students to actually use it in situations where they might actually have to. Um, so just kind of being aware of like that critical take is important and also how do you also help students understand um, it in a way that doesn't keep them from needing from do using it when they need to. All right, what about the absent voices? Well, I can tell you right now, and so many of the discussions I've seen and read, the thing that is missing the most is the students. This is a group that is largely absent from the discussion. It has been largely administrators and faculty and experts, but the students, the people who are going to have to really think about these tools and how they're going to impact their jobs are going to have all sorts of implications. Um, and so the benefits of this are none. Like having, uh, starting whether it's in the classroom or at the institution level or wherever the absence of the student voice is really concerning and can be a real challenge um, and the drawbacks is that this never ends well right leaving them out of this conversation is not doing uh, justice to them and not helping them understand what this tool can do in positive ways or the ways that it can help them professionally or culturally or socially there's a lot about it. The thing I like about ChatGPT a lot is how much it can help folks access the, as, as they call it, the hidden curriculum of higher education, but really the hidden curriculum of the world, uh, the hidden, hidden curriculum of culture and society. Um, just thinking about, you know, people that might have um, uh, different challenges around communication and the ways that this can significantly help them. To me, it's like, why aren't we hearing and engaging students within this conversation? So that actually brings me to College Unbound's approach. I'm at College Unbound. It's in Providence, Massachusetts. Oh, it's Providence, Massachusetts. It's in Providence, Rhode Island, and has several other iterations, including in Philadelphia, Chicago, and Newark currently. So the first thing that happened is in December of 2022, we discovered that uh, some students were using it. And me and a colleague, Autumn Keynes, had some rich discussions about what that meant and how we should approach it. Uh, we didn't want to approach it in a punitive way. It was the end of the semester. The tool was so new, many institutions' policies, including our own, didn't quite cover it because it grounded usage in human usage and it, or it grounded, you know, uh, acquiring stuff from other people. And well, AI isn't another person. So we had some good conversations. We ended up surveying the students to understand what, what you know, how, how are they using it? Why are they using it? And so, you know, we gave that some consideration. We gave that some thought and it ultimately encouraged along this helped me think about, well, what does it mean to think about this tool and include students in the conversation? And so, we came up with a course that we called AI in Education, and it's a course that has been taught in the session one, uh, spring 2023. And the course brings together students at College Unbound, and we are learning more about ChatGPT. We're playing with it. We're, we're doing lots of different things and trying to figure out what is the right usage policy for a AI generative tools at our college for students and faculty. 
And that was really, you know, when I ha when we had that moment, that, that, that realization of this is the right path forward, it just felt right. It felt meaningful to be engaged with students in hearing what they have to say and figure out this together, because it's going to really impact, it's going to impact all of us. And to, to come up with things without their insight just didn't feel right. But the first thing we had to do was come up with a temporary policy. And the temporary policy was, you know, students could use it but it shouldn't represent more than 25% of their work. That 25% was purely arbitrary. We want it to be enough to make students feel safe that they could use it. And we encourage them to, or the framing is like you use it and cite it and highlight it just as you will, or, or indicate that it's from another source, either by highlighting or bold facing or whatever, um, and cite that it's from ChatGPT. So we wanted them to feel comfortable using it so that if they did use it, we can follow up and have conversations about that usage. Uh, and then we also gave, you know, ultimately the, the decision of beyond that really rested with faculty and faculty could customize their policy within their course based on the course because different courses may have different levels of expectation. Um, and so now as we're finishing the first, we're finishing that first course, students have a set of policy that they have put together. And what's going to happen is in our second session in the spring, which starts in mid-March, is we're going to run the course again, but we're going to run the course with uh, first year students who are taking a writing course. And we're going to have them actually engage in trying out the policy. They're gonna test the policy. They're gonna kick the tires. They're gonna do that and faculty of those writing courses are also going to be made aware, made aware of it and be also involved in the conversation about what does it mean to be using these tools and, and where does this policy fall short? Where is it doing really well? And trying to understand the mechanics of it. And so we're really excited to do something around this that actually centers the student's voice and their ideas to help figure out what does it mean that this new tool has arrived. We're going to see lots of different versions of it. And we want to balance, you know, what it means to demonstrate learning and also to be able to use a tool that could really help students um, feel comfortable in lots of different ways and also be able to be on, be involved in something that isn't going away and that's going to have lots of impacts for lots of industries. All right. So what does this all mean for education? Uh, and this is where some of my predictions come in and it, for consideration, um, but we should always take my thoughts with many, many grains of salt. So I honestly think places like Southern New Hampshire University, Western Governors University, Arizona State University, you know, the production behemoths of courses, um, they will likely be the first entities to do large scale implementation of AI generative tools. And they'll do it to replace most of their army of instructional design, uh, instructional and course designers and find ways of making instructional faculty or finding ways of making instructional faculty teach more students while not paying them any different. Uh, and they'll do this largely by requiring those instructors to work with AI to create feedback and, and the like, uh, as well as use AI systems for monitoring and giving feedback for, to faculty and students on their performance. But I think a lot of higher ed is going to miss the conversation around AI and education because they're going to be looking at it straight on. They're going to be looking at and thinking about how AI will replace them in the classroom and frame it in the current model of how teaching and learning exist. If AI does take hold, it's not going to look, it, it's going to look different from how traditional learning in higher education looks because traditional higher education is built upon a model of convenience and doesn't necessarily center the students in how they learn. Rather, they center on a critical mass of students, a centralized location, a frequency of visiting that location for arbitrary sets of time that were set by the Carnegie Foundation over a hundred years ago. And that's not going to be how learning with AI is going to look. It's just not. It's going to be more dynamic in when and how long it happens. It's going to be a mixture of generalized and contextualized to the individual and probably, unfortunately, less social. And so importantly for the rest of us, uh, we'll have to anticipate changing or continuing to change our teaching and learning practices. We can no longer be the production lines and focused on the banking model of education. AI generative tools will beat us every time in terms of speed, timeliness, context, scale, and efficiency. So we need to reposition teaching and learning 
in increasingly to relationship building with, through which trust and risk can feel more possible by students. It's a way of offering something that will be different from what AI learning can do. I certainly have more thoughts on this and it'll either be a future video or a blog post, but um, that's, that's really where I see the future of this is recognizing it's not going to look exactly like we think it's going to look. And that, where, that is where I think we're gonna miss or misunderstand how it's going to show up and how it's going to help people learn and help people advance um, and have to make us, meaning higher education as a whole, think differently about what it means to have a classroom, what it means to teach and how does that look. I'm imagining more of apprentice model type structures um, than mass classes of three, four, five hundred as happens at some places. So. That's all I have for now. Um, I hope this video is helpful, interesting, useful. Uh, if you enjoy it, as always, hit the like button. Um, feel free to share it. And if you have questions or thoughts, feel free to put them in the comments or feel free to reach out. And I would love to have additional conversations. Thank you so much.